All right, so we've talked about pavements as a whole. We've talked about um, design. And uh, what Brian's asked me to cover here is the idea of putting overlays down with a special emphasis on local roads. And that does get a little challenging. You know, putting a, uh, an extra four to six inches of concrete in the middle of a cornfield is easy because the sky is literally the limit. When we start fooling around in uh, urban settings, then all sorts of fun breaks loose because you're dealing with bridges and you've got to get under them. You're dealing with intersections and driveways, um, curbs, manholes. And so it, it's not quite so simple. Technically, we can do it, but it does require a little but I'll start off with just a bit of an, a, a motivation. Why do we even talk about overlays? Well, let's step back a little bit. A lot of our primary roadway system is getting old. It's almost as old as I am and way more tired. So what do we do? You know, when a roadway starts to get beyond its use by date, what are our choices to get it back into service? Well, the first and obvious one is toss it out and start again. Beat it up, rip it up, and throw it away. And we've done that in the past. But in an age of sustainability, is that a good thing? We're wasting a whole lot of material. We are creating a disposal headache approach if we are trying to save the resources of our planet. Now again, if we rip it up and throw it away, we can get a pretty good long-term solution. Yeah, okay, but is that enough to balance out the negative sides of what we're doing? It also takes time. This actual roadway, uh, I seem to recall, uh, it's on Route 35 between Ames and uh, Minneapolis. And I was going up there pretty regularly to see my daughter in college, and it felt as though it took months to do the earthworks or the, the recovery stuff. So it, for months, they were beating the old concrete out, removing it, finding another place to putting it, putting the new earthworks in, and then all of a sudden, the new concrete was down and we were driving on it. So again, there's a time issue, and it's not just the concrete dealing with the stuff that was already there. And so the traffic issue was significant. Literally, it was months where we were driving on two lanes where there should have been four to deal with the traffic. All right, I was begging my daughter to change universities and move closer to home. She refused. Okay, so the next cho choice is, well, we can just patch it. And we end up with a city that looks like that, and that is one very unhappy city engineer. All right. Again, we, there we're going to the other extreme. The environmental impact is very small, because all we're doing is drilling out a little stripe here and there and filling it up with other stuff. In this case, black stuff. All right. How long does that last, do you think? Yeah, no. He's back in there patching his patches every couple of years. It's unreliable. And again, the visual side of it, the ride quality is awful. So yeah, if you're trying to buy a couple years until you can raise money to do a real solution, that sort of approach is not unreasonable, but it's not a long-term fix. All right? So then the other alternative, let's play with the idea of an overlay. And this seems to have a lot of appeal because the equity that we have in the existing system is retained. The old pavement, whether it's concrete or asphalt, stays there. We're not having a disposal headache. We're using that system as a really good foundation. And as Brian was talking about, the better the foundation system that we have, the better the concrete pavement is going to be in the long run. Provide whatever life you want. So again, if you're on a short-term horizon, you're already scheduled to replace the pavement in five years, you've just got to buy a bit of time. A very thin overlay will provide that. We can give you a short, 
or if you're needing to keep it going for another 20, 30 years, there's also the possibility to do that. But as I already said, in an environment like this, the connections to the driveways, the overheads, the, the manholes can be a bit of a challenge. We've managed to do it. It is possible. All right. This is probably a new image. We haven't used it before. In previous documents, we've talked about the two different families of bonded and unbonded. Brian referred to those a little earlier. Uh, and we got pretty explicit about bonded concrete on asphalt, unbonded concrete, blah, blah, blah. And what we're finding is we're getting ourselves a little confused because when we're putting concrete down on asphalt, is it bonded or unbonded? It depends. It depends on the weather, how old the existing asphalt is. And we found ourselves getting a little gray. So we're starting to move towards trying to simplify the whole conversation a little bit. Is that, yeah, we'll talk about a, a bonded system. And generally, then you are using, you're actually tying yourself to the existing system. It's not just a foundation, it's part of the structural system. So you can make your concrete pretty thin. If you're going to go that way, whatever it is you're putting it onto has to bond, and it has to be pretty good condition, and it has to stay there. So if you're putting it onto old asphalt that has the potential to strip, yeah, no, you're not doing what you really want to do. Trying to get a reliable long-term bond on an existing concrete system can also be a challenge. Because often as not, we do get some separation, some peeling. So the more reliable system in many ways is to look at this idea of an unbonded system. If you're doing an unbonded on asphalt, that's fine. Just whatever you've got there, throw it down. You don't use that sheer connection as part of your design system. It doesn't really matter what you put it on, as long as it's reasonably smooth. If you're trying to do an unbonded on a concrete layer, you have to pay attention to making sure that it is indeed unbonded. So you need a separation layer. And I'll talk about that in a couple of slides. So again, if you're doing bonded, the existing system has to be in good shape. It must be rough, clean, uh, sorry, yeah, rough, clean, and hard. If you're doing an unbonded, <coughs> You're looking for reasonable smoothness, but basically the condition is less critical in our lives. And again, I've already talked about this. If you've got a shear connection, you can rely on the existing system. If you haven't got that shear connection, basically it's a new pavement carrying its own loads, just sitting on something that's actually pretty stiff and pretty good. All right, predicted life, 15, 25 sort of years. We've been doing some number crunching with overlays throughout Iowa. We've been tracking data coming out of Minnesota, Indiana. People are starting to record the lifetime. And this number of about 25 years is, seems to be rolling out pretty commonly. So, but that is based on the assumption that you've got a good design and you've got good construction practices. I can't remember if I threw it into the slide set, but one of the projects we just completed uh, we reviewed 2,000 miles of overlays in Iowa and found that 80, 80, about 90% of them ran out to the, about this 25-year design life. And they, many of them still had a lot of life still to go based on the PCI. What we did find is that there were a limited number of pavements that were going to hell really fast, 10 years, and they were already pretty much done. So then we sent a student out, and he had a merry summer driving around looking at all the overlays throughout the, the state, and came back and said, everybody's to blame. Is that some of them were a design that was inappropriate for the system that we had in place. Some of them were that the existing pavement was just too far gone before we put the overlay on it. And some of them were lousy workmanship. The water cement ratio was wrong. The sawing was too late, and so we had the random cracking, those sort of issues. So we could find issues with the mix, the construction, and the design. What was really intriguing, though, is that when we plotted our data out of the life projection of all of these pavements, it came out to an average of about 25 years, 
if we, if we did the, the, the really good student thing, where you don't like the data from the poorly performing systems, you delete it and hope the professor doesn't notice. We did that. We took out the bad ones. And all of a sudden, those curves went out to 45 years. And I got a pretty good so loud signal out of that, is that if I can prevent those 10% poorly performing systems, I can promise 45 years at no extra cost. And all the agencies are going, yeah. All right. So <coughs> paying attention to the details and getting it right will buy us a lot of time. And that's not trivial. OK. So how do we do this? There's a process. We've got to think it through. What have I got here? Is it asphalt or concrete or a composite? Do I want to go with bonded or unbonded? And I've already talked about how we think about those decisions. If we're in an urban sitting, we probably have to do some grinding because I haven't got room to go up a whole hell of a lot. So if I rip out two or three inches of material and put back four, it's a whole lot easier than putting four or five on top of the existing layer. So if we need to, we can grind. If there is damage underneath, you know, we need to make it reasonably smooth. You don't want to have an undersurface that's very contoured. What about widening? Now, again, in an urban setting, widening is not normally much of an issue. It is common in when we're doing rural sections because you're going from a 12-foot lane with no shoulders to a 15-foot lane with a 3-, 4-foot shoulder. We, you know, we're on a couple of pavements we've looked at which started very thin, and on our third overlay, it's now getting pretty wide. So we've got multiple steps of widening. We have to prepare our interface. We do the paving. We cut the joints. And uh, we've got a pavement that we can put the traffic back onto. And again, uh, Eric did all the talk about how to do the, the number crunching and the design. So he, I can skip over that slide quickly in case I've spelt anything wrong. Uh, um, Again, we do have to pay attention in an urban setting to how we're going to deal with the manholes. And there are adjust, you know, options for adjustable rings. We can do box outs so that we can come back and put new manhole covers in later on. So it's, it's certainly possible, but you've got to stop and think about it. For the existing curbs, again, we've got several different alternatives. Leave the alternative place and just do a little bit of a grind uh, so that your final layer is higher in the center and at the same level at the edge. Otherwise, you can do some variation of ripping off a portion or the whole of the existing curb uh, and, and replacing it. So again, this takes engineering thinking. This is the, there are tools available to help us do that, but uh, we're not giving you rules of thumb, if then else because there's a whole lot of other stuff. You've got to stop and think about it. And I know that every consulting engineer in the room is sitting there going, I don't have time to think. Tough. That's what you're being paid to do, think. And that's what we've got to do in situations like this. <clears throat> all right, having offended all the consultants, we'll keep going and pick on the contractors. Again, prepping the surface. Badly deteriorated joints. Why did they deteriorate? Is it decracking, ASR, alka, um, oxychloride reactions? Are they going to keep going? You know, there was one street that I commuted on for years where, the, the, in this case, it was an asphalt overlay on a concrete pavement. It was a decracker. The existing concrete has basically turned to mush. And so the city came along and threw three inches of asphalt on top of it. And it worked pretty well until the first winter when all of that mushy, decracked concrete froze and lifted about two inches. So now we had a roller coaster, speed bumps every 12 feet. So the city's solution to that was to come along and grind them flat. And then we hit summer, the ice thawed, and I had speed divots every 12 to 15 feet, so the city would come back and fill them up again. And they did that every six months for several years until they finally got cross with this and again removed the whole system and replaced it. But, you know, again, 
Think about what's underneath there, what's it going to do, is it going to keep moving, is it going to cause distress in my new layer. When we're talking about bonded systems, we've got to have bonds. So the existing asphalt has to be thick enough and in pretty good condition. If we're doing unbonded, <coughs> again, particularly with concrete, you really want to keep those two systems separate. One, primarily because we're worried about cracks penetrating through from the old to the new, reflective cracking. We did an example uh, last year. We put down a, a test section where the, the county engineer said to us, I don't care. I'm not doing any prep on the existing surface. Just throw the, the overlay on top of it. And sure enough, within a year, we've got a whole lot of reflective cracking coming through. And he's shrugging his shoulders and going, I guess I asked for it. Uh, so he still likes his pavement, but it's not as pretty as he would have liked. Our recommendation at the moment for an unbonded system is to go with a, a, geo, a, a polymer, uh, the, the, the felt type of approach. Because what we're seeing in several locations is if you put down a fresh asphalt one inch layer as an unbonding layer, it doesn't always stay there. Again, water movement is critical. And if you build this thing in a bathtub, or if there's high flow, there is stripping, and all of a sudden you've got the concrete standing on not much at all. And without the support, we start to, to get some distress. Uh, so we're starting to think that the, 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 the geotextile is probably the recommended way to go if you're going to be doing an unbonded system. If you're, if you're, again, placing on top of a fairly good asphalt system, and you don't have to worry about that too much. All right, so the separator layer, and, and again, the intent is to absorb a little bit of differential and to prevent the, ref the reflective cracking and also to provide a little bit of a cushion so that you're not too stiff. You know, again, some of the tables that Brian was talking about. Improved stiffness is good, but if we get too stiff, then we're actually inviting problems with if there's a little bit of warping, there's no give in the system. And so the ride starts to fall apart pretty quickly. Panel sizes, again, this is more Eric's world than mine, but you know, we've, we've discussed and some of the, the rules of thumb of how big should the panels be. One of the things we also have to think about when we're matching thickness and joint spacing is you really want to keep the joints out of the wheel path because more damage will occur if you've got the joint in the wheel path. There's a street quite close to where I live where they did, I think it was a two inch overlay, and they put the joints in it at two feet, and it looks pretty much like this, a nice little chain. It actually survived pretty well. It's more than 10 years old. What we're finding though is that again, joint de deterioration is starting to get them. So the joints are starting to ravel out, and the ride is deteriorating pretty quickly. I think it's gonna have to be replaced again reasonably soon. Uh, so again, Anything we can do to remove the joint maintenance issue, unless you are being very deliberate about the thin concrete panel approach, uh, but you know, keeping control of the number of joints is a good thing. One little bit of advice that we learned the hard way, if you're cutting a joint in a thin overlay, that joint has got to go full depth to, to match up. If this is a bonded system, you've got an existing joint, if you don't go full depth, what you find is that the existing crack has opened up a little bit, and then your new crack is not as wide. You can end up with some compression stress as the whole thing starts to move backwards and forwards. Um, so again, thin bonded overlay system, your joints have actually got to go right the way through. The other one that did catch us on one street is that we overlaid on a fairly old pavement that had skewed joints. And then the contractor came along and recut the new joints in pretty much the same place, but he cut them straight. And again, we ended up with a whole bunch of uh, triangular failures because the skewed, skewed joints were not running in the same places as the new saw cuts. And uh, that, that set up some entertaining movements. What about the concrete? Perfectly ordinary concrete. We don't need to make anything fancy. So whatever your standard spec is for the moment, go for it. That's all we need. You know, again, <coughs> it's assuming the spec that you've got at the moment is a good one. I'll just, if you, if you need commentary on, 
the performance engineered mixtures side of the conversation, but you know, the critical parameters, water semi ratio, air void system, lots of supplementaries, you need to pay attention to those to get good concrete. Something that we found really useful when we're working with, with overlays is to go the stringless approach. You can get a 3D design done in the computer well before you arrive on the site. It makes it a whole lot easier, again, particularly in an urban setting, because a string line in an urban setting is an invitation for a problem. Someone's going to trip over it. Some homeowner is going to drive over it. So a stringless route will be better off. There are claims you get improved string smoothness. Again, that's very dependent on operation, construction, and the design of the system. But it, it does improve you know, the reliability, and your clearances get to be a whole lot easier. <coughs> one of the challenges is trying to build an overlay under traffic. We did one test section in northern Iowa where the DOT agreed to let us experiment. And so we had a pilot car, I think, they limited us, I think they said, three and a half miles under uh, dual traffic at any given time, which it, it really delayed the project, because if we'd been allowed to shut it down, get on there and pave it and come back, we probably would have been complete in a month or two. Because we were futzing around with three and a half miles, do the other side, next three and a half miles and do the other side, it, it slowed things down significantly. And it actually... Um, but it was a good learning experience. Uh, and again, safety was a little bit of a concern, but the pilot car helped to keep it a little safer. But uh, it can be done, but probably not the most cost-effective way to do it. Curing is not optional. Concrete has to hydrate. You have to provide it with the moisture and the warmth for that hydration to happen. Personally, I'm pretty sold on the poth polyethanol amines. What's it? P PAMS um, products. They seem to provide a whole lot more benefit than many other products. Uh, so, and again, Diane talked about it's got to be white. Put your helmet down, put a piece of paper down. Yeah, anything. The other thing to make sure is cure the sides. And if you can, get inside and cure inside the joints after you cut them. Yeah, I know. I'm a lab rat. I can talk about theory. But it's still a good idea. States in blue are those that have built overlays successfully. It's not uncommon, and it's not a crazy idea. ACPA has the Concrete Overlay Explorer, where you can actually go in and click on any one of those buttons and get the intimate details of the overlays that have been recorded on this database. Eric, when was the last time this thing was updated? I shouldn't ask. It's been a couple of years. Okay, so it is being updated. That's great. But it, it's a really good resource of, of information on thickness, design details, performance, where it is. Uh, <coughs> okay, here's that chart I was talking about, you know, we, of the, the data that we had next in Iowa, is that we got a lot of con concrete overlays. Now, the one interesting thing about this data set, though, is that it's all in county roads with very limited traffic. Now, Minnesota has been building them on expressways, so they've got some more experience on the heavier loaded roadways. But they're, also, they're performing in much the similar uh, way. Is that we're getting good life out of these things as we want them. So where do we go in the future? One of the things we, we, we actually put down last week is a trial section. I managed to convince a county engineer to let us build 600 feet of a six-inch overlay, two lane wide, with no saw cuts and lots and lots of fiber in it. How it's going to perform, I have no idea. Come back in a year. <laughs> uh, it hasn't cracked in the week that it has been down. Uh, so we will be monitoring that one with, with quite a lot of interest. Uh, it was also a good learning experience on how do we design a mixture with a lot of fiber in it. And we, we, we got it down. In fact, the, the fiber manufacturer was saying he thought we had too much paste in the system. The contractor was certainly very happy that workability for him was not an issue. The other where, place where I think there is an opportunity is internal curing. This idea of putting lightweight fine aggregate into the concrete so that you reduce 
the differential, the temperature differential, the moisture differential, because you're getting uniform curing throughout the depth of the section. And if it's uniform drying, you're going to reduce your warping significantly. And that means we can do thin panels and still keep the joints out of the wheel parts. And I think that's a huge benefit. We've built two pavements about a year ago. We're tracking those performance. I had a whiny email from my student this morning. He's, I've had a student go out there every season of the year. He's, it's more than a year old. I've made him be there in January with a LIDAR measuring the shape of the slabs, hot and cold, wet and dry. And he's, he's got lots of data. He's still figuring out how to process the numbers. But he's trying to convince me that, yeah, internal curing systems are moving a whole lot less than the conventional systems. And to me, that is a huge benefit. The, the ride is better. The risk of cracking is better because we get less, less warping. I'm not sure about internal curing for thicker sections, but for, for, for thin overlays, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's a good way to go if we can address the product handling issues. All right. Again, we've already seen this. There is some guidance out there. It's a free download on our website. There's a couple of other documents on thin overlays on parking lots, uh, which we did for uh, ReadyMix Association. Um, so any questions or information we can help you with, feel free to contact us. Let me get off the stage and let my brain slow down a little. I'll catch up with you after. Yeah. And uh, yeah. You, you mentioned a lot of fiber in that. Yeah. Seven, seven and a half pounds okay. per, per yard. So that's typical macro synthetic. Macro synthetics, yeah. yeah. It's double what they would normally do. Typically zero, uh, but a few places have put in four with the idea that, again, that they're extending the joint spacing a little bit. They've gone from a 15-foot to a 20-foot joint spacing without any negative effects. If you want guidance on designing with fibers, Jeff Ressler has published a tool. I think it's available on our website, but it's a little bit of number crunching where you, you actually have to get in the lab and measure the residual uh, st strength after pe post-peak, and you can feed that back into the, the design process. And Jeff, Jeff has got a very effective tool for doing yeah, that. It's, it's a pretty nifty little tool if you're interested in that. Yeah. That's good, because I'm rapidly out of my depth, so I'm glad you haven't got any All more right. questions with that. All right, thank you, Peter. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs>